Stanley, if I may call you so, by all means, as we have been doing. Um, of course, mm, we, first of all, we are very grateful f to you uh, for receiving us here. This is your house in Madrid, since you are a corresponding member of the Royal Academy of History, and this is uh, a privilege to be able to, to sit here talking with you in this palace of the Royal Academy of History. It's also a very mm, uh, great intellectual uh, privilege to be able to ask you about many questions which keep uh, interesting us in Spain. The question I wanted to start with is whether you have a, a feeling about the singularity or the peculiarity of Spain, uh, whether you think that Spain is like France or like uh, any other European country, or you think that there is a singularity as it happens with England, or indeed an exceptional difference as it happens with, with Russia. And of course that would also have a relevance when it comes to talking about the Spanish Empire afterwards. The history of Spain has been probably more misunderstood than that of any other Western country misunderstood to the extent, in fact, that there's been a tendency sometimes to treat Spain as though it were almost a separate kind of civilization and not part of the European West. In fact, Spain is, in one sense, the most determined part of the European West because it was a country that established itself during the Middle Ages uh, by re attaching itself to Western Europe uh, firmly through the reconquest of the territory that had been occupied by the Muslims. That is, Spain made an effort to be part of free Western institutions and therefore put more energy into that effort probably than any other Western country. The triumph of Spanish history in the Middle Ages was in fact that it managed to affirm itself and establish itself as a regular part of Western Europe with all the West European institutions. That is, it had the same kinds of political institutions with monarchy and with parliament, the same kind of Western uh, Roman-based and Germanic-based legal institutions, the same culture with the universities, the same religion, uh, to a large extent the same economic structure as well. Spain in that sense became, during the Middle Ages along with other countries, a typical West European country. On the other hand, it was also special and somewhat different because it was a frontier country and devoted itself for centuries to the task of the reconquest, of affirming itself as a Western country, developing institutions and driving out the Muslims. So this gave it a focus that other Western countries did not have. It meant also that Spain developed particularly as a kind of military and frontier society and did not develop in some ways economically quite as much as areas such as northern France or the Low Countries or southern England. Uh, as soon as this phase of history was completed, on the other hand, uh, it gave rise to a new epoch of Spanish history, which again was both common and also different. Spain as part of the power system of Western Europe, but also as the new imperial empire with the discovery and the conquest of America, with the rise of the Spanish Empire in Europe. And this made Spain, of course, not merely part of Western Europe, it always had been part of Western Europe, but a great power and the leading power in Western Europe for over 100 years. Uh, at the same time, this placed a great burden on Spanish society because it was engaged in a long series of wars. It became the leader in the religious struggle of the Counter-Reformation. It was the leader for the first half of the 16th century in the struggle against Ottoman, Turkish, and Muslim expansion in the Mediterranean. So that altogether this second great period of Spanish history was characterized by particular burdens and responsibilities, which had the effect in some respects of retarding the internal development of the country. Last phase of Imperial Spain in the 18th century was much happier and quiet time. It lost crown possessions in Europe it maintained all the overseas empire 
and it developed greater internal strength and became then again one of the three great powers of Western Europe, France, Britain, and Spain, uh, so that it was able to contribute, for example, to the independence of the United States, not because of any great Spanish love of the American colonies, but because of the rivalry with Imperial Britain. And that was an important contribution by Spain to American independence. The third general period of Spanish history, of course, was that of the 19th century of the tremendous internal difficulties and conflicts first caused by the Napoleonic invasion, which was very destructive, much more destructive to Spain than to any other European country, even more than in Russia. Part of Russia was scorched by the French intervention, but only part of it, and only for six months. Spain was ravaged by years and years of war in many different parts of the peninsula and then riven by internal conflict so that the 19th century became a third period of difficulty and of controversy, even though Spain distinguished itself by having some of the most advanced political institutions to be found in any country in the world during the 19th century, though without the society and the economy uh, on which these institutions could be successfully based so that the problem of modernization, which had emerged in the 17th century, remained a major problem until it was finally resolved in the second half of the 20th century. When it comes to the applicability of such a singularity to the Spanish Empire, uh, I would like to ask you one thing, and for that I would like to quote you and read from your book, uh, Spain, A Unique History, which I have read and reread with great interest. You say in it, um, the American Empire, Spanish American Empire, received little attention and not that much immigration during the 16th and 17th centuries the crown's main concern being reception of the gold and silver, primarily the latter, that became crucial to its finances. The estimates are that no more than 300,000 Spaniards went to America during the entire colonial period, while not all the survivors of the journey remained there permanently. These were just enough to establish the beginnings of a new hybrid Creole and Mestizo society, which, largely left to its own devices, proved impressively loyal and resilient amid the trials of the 17th century. And my question is very simple. Why? Why did it last for so long? How did they manage to create a stable, uh, Creole and Mestizo society, uh, as you say, impressively loyal and resilient amid the trials of the 17th century. Is it because the administration worked reasonably well? Uh, mm, why do you think it was? Well, I, I think this responds to a, a series of different factors. The Spanish Empire was quite different in some ways from the British Empire. The British Empire was almost exclusively a settler empire of English people, English and Scottish and Irish people who emigrated and set up their own societies. Uh, the Spanish Empire was based on a series of institutions which were really brought from the experience of medieval Castile and medieval Aragon and set up as uh, kingdoms under the Castilian crown. It had an administrative structure which was firm and reasonably resilient, but it was not intensively administered. That is, it enjoyed a great deal of de facto autonomy so that the uh, in citizens of the empire really uh, had the freedom to live their own lives to a considerable extent. And it was a society based, first of all, on an extensive degree of intermarriage, even though the peninsula Spaniards were always the dominant upper class, it created a new kind of society which was not merely a settler society, but was an interbred and intermarried society. Uh, it had a firm religious identity, even though not all the native population 
was converted to Catholicism. It had religious unity. It had a similar set of institutions throughout an enormous geographical expanse that is the same kind of municipal governments, uh, the, the same kind of uh, uh, administrative structures existed uh, with relatively few differences throughout this enormous empire. Uh, and it created a sense of identity within the population in their own terms that proved quite resistant to foreign conquest. The Spanish Mariana was attacked from the outside many times during the 17th century and even through the first half of the 18th century and always resisted these attacks. Even when very small parts of it were conquered, the foreign powers, the, 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 the British or the Dutch or the French, did not maintain possession very long. And in fact, the empire was protected by the inhabitants of the empire themselves, mm -hmm. not primarily by a Spanish army or navy, though those were factors on, on some occasions, but particularly it was the self-defense and resistance of the citizens of the empire themselves who considered themselves to be loyal subjects of the Spanish, that is technically the, the Castilian crown. Do you think that there is some sort of remaining impact north of Rio Grande or north of the Gulf of Mexico, I mean in the southern uh, states of the United States or the uh, western ones, there is this peculiar fact that the, the endeavors of Fray Junipero Serra were so important in, in, in what is now California, both the, the U United States and the Mexican Californias, and, and then the sailors who, who explored the Pacific northwards. There is this curious uh, incident in Nootka Bay, actually between three powers, between Spain, England and Russia. Uh, how do you think that certain facts, like, such as the boundaries, uh, the administrative boundaries, the, the highways, the Caminos Reales, uh, have remained in the political and administrative life of the United States of America? That's a complicated question to answer because what one sees is that the entire southwest of the United States is full of Spanish names, as is part of the southeast as well. This was really the last part of the American empire. Um, it was entered uh, in the 17th century, and then in the case of California, only in the 18th century in the very final generations of the empire. These institutions, of course, established nuclei of Spanish culture, which survived Americanization and exist down to the, to the present day, uh, not really in terms of nomenclature, not really in terms of certain aspects of, of local culture, uh, but in terms of also points of uh, formal cultural reference, for example, the, the use of the language, the uh, introduction of Spanish terms into uh, Western American English, and of course the fact that Spanish itself has always been since the time of the 18th century, since the beginning of the United States, has always been and still is the most studied foreign language in the United States. So there are all kinds of, of, of continuities even from the 18th century, not to speak of course of the immigration of the Hispanic population which became quite marked in the latter part of the 20th century. There is uh, uh, a, an Hispanic heritage which is marked in the southwest you won't find it, of course, in the Northeast at all. It is very regionalized, but very definite, and is responded to in different ways in various parts of the country. In California, for example, which has become virtually a, a separate culture in the United States itself, there's always been a kind of romanticization of the Spanish heritage. And you see that even in the way in which people in California try to pronounce Spanish terms and names at least semi-correctly. It's not the attitude in Texas where, of course, the relationship with Mexico uh, was determined by the outcome of a rather savage little war. And the, Mexican, and the, the, the Texans uh, regard these things linguistically in quite a different way. But in Texas, of, co of course, as well, there remains a great deal of Hispanic heritage. So uh, one finds uh, this very strongly in the Southwest. 
And one finds it also in terms of the uh, high culture of the United States as well, since Spanish literature and Spanish art has always been studied in American schools and in American universities since the 18th century. This has always been a kind of point of reference, even at a time in which Americans sometimes did not have a very high opinion of contemporary Spain or of Spanish history in general themselves. So this has always remained a point of some cultural reference that has received attention in the institutions of higher learning. Uh, there's a certain contradiction involved here. If I may, um, curious footnote to what you've been explaining very lucidly, uh, the uh, linguistic heritage that has uh, subsisted in the in the South or the Southwest or the, the, of the United States, and indeed has extended itself uh, throughout the English-speaking world sometimes, have had the boomerang effect. I think linguists call it boomerang words. For instance, you adopted, you invented the word alligator, which comes from el lagarto, which means the lizard, quite simply, a very big lizard still. El lagarto became the alligator, and then it came back to, into Spanish as alligator. Uh, I think that is a, a tidy little metaphor of the bizarre uh, workings of languages when they come into contact. The other bizarre fact is that we begin to say in Spain to pronounce the English way quite a lot of place names. Uh, which were originally Spanish and never pronounced that way. Now, it's uh, more generally said Miami than Miami in Spain. Uh, I hope that we will stop short of saying Los Angeles in Spanish, uh, but one never, knows what, one never knows what will happen with all those angelic names. I wanted to ask you uh, also your opinion on, on a point that I find I cannot answer myself. Uh, is it a paradox? Uh, what is the explanation of the fact that the several centuries of Spanish presence in the New World began with a typically Renaissance uh, attitude, uh, philosophical, religious, Erasmian in a way, um, political, and then it ended again with a very mm, unusual state of mind, uh, perhaps more unusual in our own state of mind, which was very much uh, an enlightenment uh, project with the scientific expeditions of Malaspina, the botanic uh, investigations of Mutis, how do you think that those unusual aspects of our presence there, of the Spanish presence there, have been understood, or are they still not understood? Do they subsist in the United States, where I know that even the English uh, presence is also has subtle gradations uh, between the beginning and the, and the end, which were much closer than in, in our case. Um, what, what, what do you think of, of that mm, long Spanish presence which went through such different phases? Human history is full of paradoxes, and certainly the history of Spanish America involved its own paradoxes. Uh, they developed very, very quickly a kind of black legend understanding of the Spanish conquest because of the avariciousness of some of the conquistadores. But in fact, with the development of the institutions of the empire, there was an attempt to extend to the Western Hemisphere and to the native Indian inhabitants uh, the uh, kinds of rights that were understood by what you were referring to as Renaissance humanism or the ideals of the West 16th century style, so that there developed a, a particular struggle for what nowadays we would call human rights in the 16th century, uh, which were applied by the crown and the leading cultural and juridical, juridical figures of 16th century Spain because of the mandate of the crown 
to Spanish America to try to protect the Indians, which were sometimes successful and sometimes unsuccessful. A, a, a large part of the Indian population was maintained really in its own territory and habitat because of the protection of the crown. Uh, and this, in fact, was a new expression of the uh, modern sense of human rights from the 16th century on that had never really been conceived in such terms before that particular era in European history. By the 18th century, by the latter part of the Spanish Empire, of course, there was a concern to modernize the empire, and this brought greater efficiency and the application of certain scientific standards. On the other hand, the tendency in 18th century culture was also with the so-called enlightenment to be very elitist about it and relatively centralized. And the fact that in the final generations of the empire, there was more of an effort of centralization and more of an elitism, a kind of modernized elitism in polity, really rubbed uh, the populations of the empire the wrong way, even the elite uh, white portions of the empire, so that it created a kind of friction mm -hmm. as uh, modern European culture, 18th century Spanish style, was reflected in the empire. So one always finds paradoxes and contradictions mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, these standards, these cultural norms, changed but they were always applied with greater or less consistently in different forms from the beginning in the early 16th century all the way down through the last phase of the empire late in the 18th century. Well, thank you very much, Stanley. It's been most enlightening since we've been talking about the enlightenment. You've given us a very good uh, practical uh, lesson on it. No, thank you indeed. But it's been my pleasure. Thank you.